Okay, so here is the, uh, the second installment of a conversation with Christine Goulet. And uh, it's interesting because Christine was like the, actually the second person that asked me to kind of reverse the roles in this. And uh, if she could, you know, she said, if she could interview me, and I said, yes, uh, as a matter of fact, um, my initial idea for this interview show that I had on uh, on my mind for a few years actually was like the the uh, title idea I had was uh, uh, me myself and you was the idea that for a title and the idea was that that you know like it was you know like you know back and forth and um, so actually in the series of um, interviews that I did with Craig on there's a whole episode where he interviews me also so uh christine i'm very happy and i can't wait for uh your direction of this conversation okay sounds good well you you wanted this to be organic so i didn't officially prepare uh so it's completely good. contrary to my style in life where everything is prepared and i have an agenda and everything's planned i said cool we'll just go with the flow and i must say i really like the format of what you're doing it's really conversation so mm -hmm. i'll question you <laughs> okay. rigorously but you know I'll interject of course so uh, so I think one nice nice place to start always is your childhood um, and what was important to you in your childhood and also how it brought up uh, you know music as a main theme for your life but there might be other things you want to talk about from your childhood so I'd be curious to hear about that yeah I mean um there, you know, there's potential to talk for a few hours, really, on this. You know, um, well, we'll start. We'll start. Yeah, yeah. So, so no, no, really. Um, I don't know. Like music really came into my life uh, via um, my parents sending me to music school um, as a as a young child. So I don't really remember. Like I was thinking that it was when I was really young, like three, four years old. Um, and I, it must must have been like that because there I was kind of like going to this, you know, like preschool kind of music school thing where I was playing uh, Glockenspiel and stuff like that, you know. But um, I, you know, like I remember like the first then real instrument I learned was the recorder, and I was about six years old. And um, after that, it was the mandolin. And um, then at 10 years old, I asked my parents, that was like the first time I asked my parents to buy me an instrument. That was like a little keyboard, uh, like a Yamaha keyboard that they bought me. And um, then I had lessons, uh, keyboard lessons, like real keyboard lessons. So like these uh, uh, 80s uh, keyboards that, uh, you know where you, you you pushed one down one key with your left hand and it would play like the, the band in the box thing right oh those the, yeah the yeah yeah, yes. yeah okay. exactly like so you a, had yeah. you had a keyboard lessons not a keyboard lessons not, not not traditional piano lessons but oh, you know funny. but then in the context of that there was uh um, suddenly there was like a music student teaching me and not the main teacher anymore and the music student obviously he was a serious musician so he kind of started teaching me piano on the keyboard right on the on the cheap casio and uh yeah and then at age 15 it was um the classical guitar that i started playing so, so, that, so hold on i want to ask you a couple yeah. of questions before we go too far so the mandolin so the recorder the mandolin that was that came with the school or those you mentioned you first asked for a keyboard but did you have a say in that or you were too young you just went with whatever they told you at first how, how was I it? was I was I was too young. I really I really okay. don't remember. Like it it was, and this is why I have to go to the age of twenty actually for it to make sense. Like up until the age of twenty, I didn't I wasn't really very um, aware of the world or even that I I have a say in it or that I could make decisions for myself and stuff like that. Somehow I also didn't know that there was such a thing as learning or practicing that really only started to come into my life when I was 20. <laughs> uh, yeah, we can, we can go into detail about that, but but but, but really like... used to play music, so the teachers must have had you practice. No, I mean, no? they want they wanted me to practice, but I never I never did. So it was just, I, you know, I was going to 
um, to these these one-on-one uh, -on -one lessons like once a week, uh, but I never practiced. It was always I always got away I got away with uh, my talent, let's say, right. And that was that that was the same in in school in regular school where like I didn't have to I didn't I can't even remember a single instance where I was doing my homework. I was, you know, always just before. I don't even. Did we talk about that in the other conversation? We, we did a little bit because yeah, I had the but, same experience. I did. Yeah. I often skipped school, and you know, I, yeah, it was yeah. easy. So yeah. Never, so yeah. so so that's why, um, you know, no, no, my parents. They for some reason, and I, I really thank them for that. And I don't know why, but for them, music or like going to uh, music school was sort of like, I guess, a sign of. Uh, of uh, I don't know of being successful parents in a way, right? Oh, were because they because they themselves? no not not at all. You know they're okay. from from working totally from a working class background, um, and so that's why I guess for them it was like doing something for me that they didn't have or that they didn't understand or something like that. You know, and um, it was. It was it was great, but like I said, like at the beginning, I didn't I didn't understand, and I was sort of like thrown into it, and I I don't really know. I don't, wouldn't even say that I enjoyed it. There was, mm. you know, I'm, I'm I'm by nature I'm a very uh, anxious person, and so like any social interaction or any appointment would meant stress for me, and still means stress for me. So so that's why I don't really have like the greatest memories about it. But there, you know, there are photographs um, um, of me with my teacher um, when I was like six years old playing or eight years old playing the mandolin and stuff because um, there were sort of like semi uh, uh, semi public performances. At the so music you had to school. do you had to do that. But as an had anxious to, person, how yeah. did you overcome? Because it's, I mean, it's you're on the spot when you play an instrument in, in public. I always felt like I wanted to, to shit myself, to shit myself, and mm. seriously, up you until my mid it. mid twenties, I you know like I was so scared of performing, and I just went through it. I, but I, wow. I really had had like big, big uh, pains, you know, like psychological pains and also physical pains. Um, yeah, it's quite amazing that you're such a performer now i mean that you overcame that but at first it was kind of forced and yeah, eventually it, it became forced. a choice you know for me like um, um like writing it uh like it like a test uh in school or or uh or at university or like like having uh my exams at university that that was sort of like the same as being on stage uh same kind of performance anxiety and pretty severe, I have to say. Like that was, um, yeah. So, uh, and let me let me think. I so can when... relate. It's funny because in my case, I wanted to look so cool, but I was yeah. super anxious mm -hmm. that I psyched myself when I was in high school. We had those exams. I did them with music in my headphones to just like I'm so cool. I don't care. Look at me, and I went through, and I was so freaking stressed inside, <laughs> but I I just didn't want it to show. So I mm. looked like yes, yeah, I sit in the back, I look despondent, and I do the test, and I'm super stressed. And then I finished it, and for me, I had to finish the first one like an hour before the people. You know, it was kind of like a pressure I put on myself, and then I finished it, I was out of there. So, but I always looked cool, but I was also very yeah. very anxious yeah i don't i don't know how i looked i mean i guess that you know that's something that i don't i don't really know but um but for me the you know there was another um problem for me because i was i'm i am left-handed and writing um like handwriting was very very hard for me like i'm mm. super slow i was so slow and uh there was like some initial trauma um, uh, learning to write where like my hand was always in the ink and like everything was. Yes. Uh, so they didn't and... force you to switch because there were a period no, they, of time they, they no. forced people. Okay. No, they didn't. They didn't force me. And that, that's a great thing. But at the same time, I was just really like never. Nobody ever helped me 
to learn mm. things properly. And that's that's also the reason why I would say I would say like in my school, uh, my school years, I never really had a great teacher. There was not a single teacher who was consciously or like apparently uh, helping me, you know, like I was just, I don't know. It's, uh, it was, it was pretty tough to realize. you were very different? You felt you were different from others and you needed more no. help or no? Just. No, no, no. I don't, I don't think okay. I needed more help. It's just, it's just with the being left-handed was such the, just the exception. Like maybe yeah. there was one other person in the class um, with that problem, right? And for some reason, they just didn't care. It, I mean, I know that in my um, um, high school, the system is different here. So after the years, um, like the fifth school year up until the 13th uh, school year, because like we're at 13, um, the first three years of that, I was in a class, which was really this, let me just call it the scum group. <laughs> Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah, because you know, seriously, and I, I, really? I didn't know, I didn't, I didn't know back then, but um, now I understand. You know, it's a pretty, pretty highly regarded school, and like they, you know, the the classes are num are, are are labeled with A, B, C, D, E, and I was in G. And, okay. And G was like was was all like uh, working class kids, and uh, like you know, they were like. Uh, three Germans and three Turkish, uh, Spanish, a Spanish guy, um, an English guy. Like it was really the class of like the people that didn't belong in with the doctor's kids and lawyer's kids that were in the other class. Was that a public school or a private school? It's a, a public yeah. school. Yeah. In, wow. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. a lot of segregation. So. Yeah, so totally, totally. And I mean, back wow. then, I, I had no idea. I did not understand this at all. I guess mm -hmm. that the, the other kids in the, in the better groups, uh, they knew. Because they, like, you know, looking back, it also explains why they, they didn't interact much with us. Right? So maybe they were even told. Um, I don't know. It's, it, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty uh, you know, strong stuff. You know, if, if you think yeah, about no, it. Yeah, no, it is. And, it, and, and when it was, you're a kid, you it don't know. It was the 80s. It was the 80s, you know. So, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't know. I had no idea. I also, really, I mean, to be quite honest, I didn't didn't care much. But when it comes to, um, you know, like being kind of like helped along the way, um, just with something basic like writing, uh, like the, the facility, you know, of handwriting, um, like nobody really helped me. And um, I kind wow, of that's unfortunate. Yeah. Wow. yeah, yeah, and and that was sort of like, and that's also why I never really understood up until I met Robert Tripp, really, when I was uh, almost nineteen years old, that there is such a thing as uh, practicing, as uh, like a, a, a methods for learning and stuff like that. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so wow. yeah, yeah. So really, so when I was when I was ten years old, and I I actually asked for um, you know that keyboard instrument, um, that was sort of like the beginning of me kind of like getting into music for real. And I had a I had a school friend, uh, an Indian guy, who was also in the same group there at school, <laughs> um, and he you know he was great and he had a classical guitar and i i wrote a couple of pieces on his classical guitar one of which actually got recorded later and was actually released it's a piece called 10 years people who are interested can can google it marcus reuter 10 years and uh, and so yeah uh, and then i got into then i got got more into it like i remember my first music teacher at school he was the kind of guy who who um you know, would tell me, like, he would give us a task, like, and, and I was, basically what I did, I, everything was wrong, like, I don't know, okay. like, always wrong, like, I didn't follow the rules, blah, 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 but at that point, I already knew what I wanted to do, and I already <laughs> had an idea for sort of, like, the sound world that I wanted to create, and obviously, that didn't fit in with the rules and stuff like that, and then in the last three years of, um, which I guess is, uh, yeah, high school, really. Uh, mm -hmm. I, um, I had a great music teacher. And that was kind of like the turning point. 
And I was also pretty, pretty bad. Like I had pretty bad grades in the first few tests, but the teacher was, was very good. And he said to me, uh, Marcus, you can, um, you can do better. And at the end of the three years, I was, I was one of the best. But so do you, so you had a, you had an interest in music. You were already ready to compose and create things. Uh, yeah. But then uh, you still didn't perform. Is, is that because there are rules? And it's, it's, it's funny. I have to tell you a story that's a bit similar. We had a piano when I was a kid. My mom played the piano beautifully. I mean, she played all the time. <clears throat> that's how she wooed my dad <laughs> in the mm -hmm. 50s. You know? And she was amazing. And so I was always playing. There was always music in my house and so on. And I played and I was three, four. I just made stuff up and I composed, quote unquote, just ad lib yeah. and played with things. And after a few years, my parents uh, agreed, you know, to, to, uh, to have me take piano lessons. And the lady now I know was, a, was an abusive teacher oh, if it was today she might have been in jail i mean she would beat me up she would yell at me she would scream and then i was also taught the the things like you know the scales all those things and i felt so stifled it's like it's it killed my musical spirit <laughs> and then yeah. i had her as for three years i started i was at, i was 10 i think and she was she would literally beat us up you know uh, and and at the, in the 80s like you we didn't we didn't know any better we were not yeah. really uh, uh aware kids that's authority that's fine you know and she would scream and every time i would leave and cry so that's one part but the other part is that all those those rules were just breaking the spirit of music to me mm -hmm. and she would she wanted to teach the classical things do you feel something like that or or you were okay to learn it or you know the the as a matter of fact uh, looking back i i would have liked to learn more of that as a kid actually okay yeah so so that's what i'm saying like the the teachers at least in the first 10 years of my life um or yeah, or something like that. Maybe twelve years. If we're not really um, about it, should be music. But as in a general, as a general, okay. more general thing, it's, but more about the specific instrument and and uh, the oh. the tradition here, at least in the music, the music schools that I went to, was more like would, you know you would work on pieces. I, oh, I can't okay. even remember ever really um, practicing scales or anything. Um, but I would, I, th I think like in my case, I think it would have probably motivated me more to actually mm. being, being, being put on a path that is not so strictly, okay, this is a piece of music and you have to play it. Like okay. I'm, I was, <clears throat> back then I was already more interested in creating music on my own. So, um, so that's why it's a little it's a little bit different for me you know like yeah. and my my oh, music yeah. my musical spirit didn't really didn't really ignite until i was 10 years old and um and i went to and i've i've, I've told this story many times and i'm going to say it again it was like my my uncle and my mother that took me to a mike oldfield show in germany um and the mike oldfield band actually which was great great musicians um sort of sort of like you know i i would say like the 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 level of a frank zappa show kind of thing mm -hmm. like level of musicianship and and it really completely inspired me to make music wow. and 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 mike oldfield as sort of like the one-man band and uh you know like writer performer uh producer um, everything in one person sort of like that kind of inspired me and that was what, where I was at you know that's why that's why performing was not so important for me because I wanted to write my own music first I wanted to know what I wanted to play um, so so playing other people's uh, compositions as a tool to become a better player just really didn't work for me and that's also why I guess why I never practiced those pieces you know. I can relate to that. I can relate to that because it's more fun to create sounds and having ideas and, and make them happen. But at the same time, to become better at playing, you know, it's it helps maybe to 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 play things that exist, right? You learn the skills. For, for sure, for sure. So, and I'm 
yeah. yeah. But it's but it's it's a kind of like a multi multi dimensional uh, uh, pedagogical place, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. Like where, where where all these dimensions sort of like matter. And I think as a as a great teacher, you would kind of like find out okay, what is, what is the path of the kid, right? Like, yeah, uh -huh. you know, to adapt the and, teachings to get the yes, most of, and then yes. you combine elements when they mature or, yeah, no, it makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, yeah. simple, simple stuff like on a piano, for example, just to have a kid say, improvise, just use the black keys, right? So mm -hmm. push down, push down the sustain pedal and just play on the black keys, you know, that kind of simple instruction that one could give as a teacher to a kid to kind of like, uh, discover this, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah to, you know to, to make the kid discover that you can actually just push down any key and it will sound interesting right this was like completely missing in my in my musical education in the first yeah like I'd say almost 20 years wow yeah yeah interesting path okay so carry on so that you said that at 19 you met Robert Fripp yeah yeah, I was okay. 18. I was 18 still. Yeah. Yeah, it and was, it did, was, yeah. How did that happen? How, I mean, uh, suddenly um, meeting somebody of that caliber out of the blue? <laughs> I, you know, I had, you know, just a few uh, months before I had discovered uh, King Crimson and was just, um, like there was like a local, local magazine where shows were announced and there was like Robert Fripp and the League of Crafty Guitarists uh, playing in uh, a place called Bielefeld and for some reason I, I, I was drawn to that and I asked uh, um, my friend's sister who had a driver's license to uh, drive me to that show. Wow that's and, so uh, cool. Yeah, because I, I didn't have a driver's license at 18 I only got it when I was 19 or 20 I think got it pretty late like i mean in, in german you can only have get it at 18. oh i got it at 23 or 24 yeah, yeah, i'm way behind <laughs> <laughs> but but anyway like she took me there and it uh, was a great show and there were um, flyers on the tables for this guitar craft course and i then asked my parents to support me and it was was wasn't wasn't cheap it was like maybe a thousand deutschmarks for the Wow. For the chorus, and then you had to bring an instrument. And I actually bought a um, like a an ovation copy, like a, a pinnacle guitar, which is like a yeah, like an ovation guitar. And so my parents helped me, even helped me then. And 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 this this course was in Switzerland, and so I can't remember how I got there by train, maybe. And it was like advent, like I said, adventure and you know anxiety don't really go uh, along with each other very well. But for some reason, like when it comes to these important points in my life, I always manage to raise the energy to do things anyway. Right? It was I, I started. You know, this became a theme in my life to kind of like work against against my um, my inner. Um, inner limitations or inner lim inner yeah limit limitations yeah stress exactly exactly yeah. mm -hmm. and somehow I've, I've overcome it um i mean i have not overcome the anxiety it's still there but i have been i've been gotten much better at just um going ahead anyway no and that's something we shared that i think i described it as a, i seek it and I and I, you made me think afterwards. You know, do I really seek it? No, it's just that I don't like that feeling of feeling limited. And so when I discover it, then I overcome things. So it's not necessarily that I seek it, but if it happens, it's like okay, I no, I can't be limited like that, and I push through. And uh, I, yeah. I, yeah, I can I can relate absolutely. But that's yeah, but you know, it's it's a strength. It's a, it's a strength. You know. You, you know, like the strength is like, I, I really think that I, I probably could have gotten, um, I don't want to say further ahead in my life, but certainly to a, to a different place if I had uh, had a different starting point, let's say, right? Like for me, just making a simple phone call is still, is still problematic, still difficult. So I don't know. But I guess like the quality um, that I have 
also this is sort of like a theme also a theme in my life um the fact that i don't that i don't rush things because i need time to gather the energy and the motivation to make that phone call let's say right so you're very Being, deliberate yes yeah. and it but it means that in the in the in the in the time that i need in order to actually do what i need to do i started actually pr to practice right so like all the skills that, I, that i've gathered over the years i i acquired them in those times where i was um you know like let's say psychologically weak right i i can so <clears throat> relate i mean i'm often asked to give talks and and i sometimes i i don't have much time to prepare and I recall leaving a voicemail for someone. My throat used to choke before I made a call. Half the time I dialed up and hung up and hung up and then, oh, it's the machine, <gasps> hung up and then went and said, okay, I can do this. And, and I mean, I was a teenager. It was like that. At the same time, I was a smart ass and I could just go on stage and improvise and make, you know, because it's like it was dissociated in a way. I don't know yeah. how, but yeah. uh, now I give talks and I'm still very nervous. And I don't think most of the time that I appear nervous um, because then I, I've learned to prepare in my own way to psych myself in. And, and I often get invited because people like the way to express myself. It's very natural. It's not super, you know, necessarily always super academic and so on. But yeah, again, it's something that it, probably doesn't show much but yeah anxiety is, is through the roof uh and most of the time it's just i i learn you learn to live with it and to overcome and there are certain things that you you get used to and eventually the funny thing is the the thing that i host them that i hate the most and that stresses me the most is being recorded mm -hmm. and here i am with you and i'm being recorded and it's all just natural talking and so on but I still, I, I force myself to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. So in, in, in that case here is different. I just like the connection and the discussions we have. It's, it's really nice. But uh, yeah, so that's something I don't like to feel. So that's why I, I often volunteer to give talks. And I know I would, oh, you know, stress out and so on because you want to overcome that. So it, mm -hmm. it's interesting. We do share that. And I use sometimes to, to blame uh, either this trait or even my parents or this or that for not having achieved certain things in my life. And I was in my mid twenties when I realized, you know what? No, that's, that's all on me. It happened this way. This is part of the process. And suddenly all the anger, potential resentment, even against myself went away because it's just, that's the path I'm going through. And that's how, you know, and we talked about my changing careers and all that stuff. And, but it, yeah, it's interesting. So you saying I could have gone further, maybe you would have gone somewhere else. Yeah. But maybe you wouldn't be as deliberate in your creation as you are and you think through. It's a whole, right? It's, a, it's as you said, it's multi-dimension and it's a lot of dimensions together. Right? Exactly. And, and I mean, um, <laughs> Let me just add this, like if we're talking about childhood. Um, so just like there was one event when I was three years old, I had, uh, I had, um, well, I had like a brain injury. Mm. Um, okay. It was just a, a car accident. Um, oh. But but I had like my, my skull was fractured and there must have been some some damage to brain cells somehow there it was impossible not like you know you couldn't you couldn't tell nobody could tell in a three-year-old right but um something 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 happened there that like i think is sort of like also defining who i am and i wouldn't say that it's like because it's impossible to to uh, to assess uh, what you what, would what, have been yeah yes, yeah exactly, it's impossible exactly. so that's why it's not even like you could say worth talking about it but I think exactly. it's exactly but but it's like this 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 trauma the brain brain trauma sort of like you know I, I have a, a friend who who told me that uh, he has like had a similar thing and and he's he's really uh, deep into researching kind of like the effects of uh, that that had on his life and stuff um 
but you know when it comes to like the anxiety and stuff like that i think that there may may or maybe there is a relation um like you like i wouldn't know what i wouldn't know you can't know and there's no. the brain is multiple parts too right that's like when they started yeah. to do lobotomies is because there's a guy who who survived with a, a freaking lance impaled in his yes. head and yeah. he was not angry anymore <laughs> so, yeah. i mean yeah. it, yeah it's no, complex i mean and the pl plasticity of the of the brain especially at that yeah. young age but what i kind of like uh, you know what i'm trying to say is maybe it was also some sort of advantage in the sense that my brain learned to be flexible right and to be um reorganizing itself rewiring yeah, and yes. all the new connections yeah and so so like when it you know like i was saying that school was what well, school was certainly super boring for me i i can't remember much at all about like my years like up, even up to like like i said like maybe i i don't know like the, i i'm always talking about the first 20 years i was like totally not there right mm. so um not engaged not engaged and and really like even now like at, i'm 48 now like looking back on the even uh up until the year 2014 or something like that if i look back no i wasn't there i wasn't even engaged with the world then like it's like and, and you know like the, the the positive perspective on that is that i'm it, i'm actually getting better i'm getting better at <laughs> at uh, noticing the world around me and noticing what's going on with me and stuff like that but what happened in 2014 why did it change uh, well well 2014 was sort of like the uh, my um, yeah my burnout year let's say okay yeah and i had sort of like always had this uh, uh, belief in seven year cycles and stuff like that. And, okay. and like my vision also was um, to, I wanted to have done everything I could imagine until my 42nd year. And somehow, somehow it worked out. Like I had done everything. I had had the uh, premiere of my big orchestral piece. I had, you know, done it, I had, you know, I, I was traveling the world making music like everything was there like i couldn't even imagine what would come after that and and somehow it was sort of like a relief right so to to mm -hmm. realize okay i'm i'm, Check I'm mark, turning, achieved, I'm, I'm, yeah yes. i'm turning 42 yeah. and i've achieved everything but the, at the same time kind of like the world world kind of like around me and my internal world sort of like i had a breakdown yeah, well, what's next if you don't have any dreams yeah. Or, or yeah, exactly there were there no there were no more dreams, and I have to say that even though like now it's seven years late seven years later, and I still I'm still not in the place where I have dreams as powerful as the ones I used to have before I was forty two. Hmm. So so it's been like this whole whole phase of my life where things were sort of like very floaty you know mm -hmm. so yeah interesting mm -hmm. okay let, let's go back to trip so you took that class you went to switzerland somehow and <laughs> you ended up there yeah. and you overcame the difficulty of uh, the interactions and so on and so how tell us more about that tell me more about yeah that. i don't i don't know uh, i think <laughs> You know, my big advantage was that I I didn't really um, like a lot of people that were there at that course. They saw Robert Fripp as sort of that guru the guy, God. And, yeah. Yeah, the mm -hmm. god and everything. And I I really liked his music. Right, I was a big fan of his music, and 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 but I I didn't I didn't have the, uh, that big uh, bubble, let's say, of whatever. Right. Yeah, so okay. I was, I so, was, I was, I was pretty, pretty open and, and I don't know, like it was, I, I always felt that there was a, was a really uh, nice mood, neutral uh, friendship there. Very, very simple. Like he was great with me 
spoke very directly with me. Um, so human to human, not uh, yeah, human yeah, exactly, to, uh, yeah, all, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and that, that it that became uh, it became more difficult later. But on that first course, I was pretty much like, okay, this is this guy, and I would really like to learn from him. So. Uh, and I like everything he did and said, like I took seriously, kind of like made it part of my repertoire of kind of like dealing with the world and dealing with music, like, right. And with practicing an instrument, like I said, that's what, when I first learned that you could even do something like that. Oh. Right? And, um, and it was nice. I remember that the, in my very first meeting with him and I showed, you know, the guitar picking like on that ovation, a copy that I mentioned and he said to me Marcus this is a very good beginning that's what he said to me and then we started talking about uh, the Chapman stick and uh, I asked him about the Chapman stick he, he said that he uh, likes it very much and that he would would have loved to play it had it been around when he started mm. and uh, I asked him also about being a left handed because he's also left-handed and he plays right-handed I'm left-handed mm -hmm. and I also play right-handed, so yeah. So I didn't know you were left-handed until now. So. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, you know, I we spoke about that in our first meeting, I think, and um, it was just it was just really nice. And and uh, like I have to say, like everything that he taught me, I still value. Um, and I'm, you know, some things I'm still working on. Um, so it's been it's been a great great introduction into um serious musicianship mm. and also the the network of people the people who went to guitar craft courses over the years has been uh, a very nice a nice network of people like basically like i i can say i almost know you know people in every country in the world it's not that <laughs> exactly true but you know like um it's it's been it's been a really good foundation of becoming sort of to, uh, to interact with um, the arts, let's say somehow. So it's more than just the music music musicianship. It's the the networking. The it's it's more than just a, say a mentor in the music sense, but it really opened up your world to meet him. Yeah, and you know that these these <laughs> courses they 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 were always international, like. Uh, and so I met um, on my first course. I met people from the U.S., uh, from uh, from Italy, from Ireland, from uh, Norway. You know, like and um, and there were and even like from uh, I can't remember from Argentina. Mm. You know, and then so it was really like in '95, I think, when I went to like my maybe second or third course. Um, there were a lot of South Americans there, and um, so I made friendships with South Americans. Actually, also with a with a very nice uh, Canadian uh, man that I'm I'm still that I still consider to be a good friend. And uh, yeah, some of us aren't too bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not not at all. Um, Just joking. Yeah, no, but it was uh, yeah, it's sort of like a. It's a kind of like a network of friends, for sure it is. And but for me, then you know, and this this may be like the more interesting fact about all of this. Uh, I am I'm actually uh, I was with that group of people, let's say, with Guitarcraft for again, and this is kind of funny to say, for exactly uh, exactly seven years. Seven years. <laughs> yeah. So it was like the the first course I went to was in I think in June ninety one. And the course where I said goodbye was in August '98. Well, you, yeah. you make those seven years. Yes, I, I seem to. I'm, I seem to. I seem to make them. Yeah, <laughs> you know. But anyway, like it was um, that my 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 decision to kind of like leave guitar craft, which I didn't really leave it, but I just didn't come didn't back. Didn't go back. Right? Yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. I didn't go back exactly. So um, what happened was that. Uh, it there at the end of these courses there's usually like this uh, uh, you know people sit in a circle or whatever and you just you know as you say goodbye and you you have a chance to say something to the others right and I hadn't prepared it but I said I actually said I said to Robert thank you for everything you've given me that I've learned from you and um, 
I sort of like really, really, it was the actual goodbye that I, and it was just intuitive to say that. It wasn't something that I had planned. Hmm. Um, but Did you I know at that time it was the end or? Yes, I kind of, I kind of knew. Okay. I kind of knew in that moment where I said it. Uh, mm. because, because it was like also this feeling that uh, like I had learned so much that I wanted to really apply that into the real world rather than reapplying it in the context of a course. Okay, you needed you know? to move on and- I needed to move step. on. Uh, yeah. And I sort, of, I sort of felt like there was so much to work with that going back would be wrong. It would be not honoring okay. what was given to me somehow mm. you know and yeah, yeah I mean, it was your duty to take what you've learned and go and release yeah. it in the wild <laughs> and you know there's an interesting story i was i was pretty cheeky uh with robert also at that time because i remember that he had uh i mean i i was i was you know young and stupid but he had he had put out he was selling merch at the chorus as well as you do as a musician right but he also put out a hat uh one night for donations right and okay. actually what so he put the hat for donations out on the on the uh on the night before uh after he sold merch he had sold okay. merch so okay. i actually then said oh i have spent all my money on merch so i can't donate anymore so i actually wrote him a little letter that i put into the hat and the oh. letter said something, Robert, next time you should ask for donations first and then still merge. Yes. <laughs> this is... That's that's because you get more of yeah, the, the profit. I mean that was, was yeah, yeah, I, I actually I actually <laughs> did that. Yeah. I don't I don't know if he if he uh, ever knew that that note was from me or not. Well, can't do remember, you know what he can't remember if I signed it or something? Do so. you know if he took your advice to heart and I, I, no, I don't know. I don't know, but I think I think he you should ask him. <laughs> I think he mentioned something at that last meeting there. But anyway, I I always felt that he was very nice, um, and I'm so grateful for what he has given me. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. It, it, it's it's funny because when I was a kid, I told you I grew up with music. Uh, my my parents listened to a lot of music. Music. My dad has so many vinyls. That's the thing. He moved in a smaller place, retired. I mean, he's 94 now. He still has all his vinyls. And in there, there's, you know, Mike Oldfield and, uh, you know, uh, Pink Floyd and King Crimson, all those things. I mean, I was raised hearing those things uh, mm -hmm. because we're the same age. And uh, one of my brothers played, you know, Jimi Hendrix. He was in love with him and he blues and all that. My other brother played rush and saga and all that and so i was always infused by that but i see all those uh, albums now you know mike oldfield the tubular bell and i see the the mouth from king crimson it's it's funny that we talk about this and you learn yes. from them and it's, yes it's, so i can understand why some people would go take the class and feel intimidated or in awe but then it prevents learning you kind of have to have that you know yeah. if it's yeah power relationships are you know, I, I also, you know, the, and this is this is kind of like a difficult topic to talk about, but music is for somebody who's like, let's, uh, this is serious about it, let's say, right? Music is more than just the music, it's art. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and in a way, in a way, Robert Fripp was more of an arts arts teacher than a music teacher mm. and this this art kind of like in, in obviously includes like you, you working on yourself so it's not so much about the musical instrument it can be or ideally the musical instrument like for me the musical instrument was part of is is like a, a tool you could say for becoming a musician mm -hmm. it's it's about becoming a musician so it's not about playing the instrument really like, and you know, people yeah, can maybe. become musicians, you know, like there, there are many, many ways that you can do that. And, and really it was, um, it was absolutely like super rare um, to get into, thrown into that kind of context at that, at that age. I, I, I have, you know, for me, it was, I was super lucky that it happened to me. 
Um, but it seems to fit with your idea of not necessarily wanting to be a performer, but expressing and discovering and creating music. So it seems what, what you had discovered, I guess, in your teens, that you wanted to create things and it was more important than the playing part. Yeah. It seems to fit with that. It's more expressing something. Um, yeah. However, however, you need to know that in, in the uh, FRIP courses, there was always uh, a part, like performance was part of that. Mm -hmm. So, so there was always like this one evening during a course where there was a, where people were asked to get together in smaller groups and work on a piece of music and present it and and so it's also like the art of performance that yeah, but I mean you that. need you need to be able to perform to be able to exploit the instrument as well. Yeah, exactly. So, exactly. As we said, this, these things all go together. It's not just yeah. one or the other. Yeah, no. What I what I was trying to say with that was that it was uh, there was a lot there also that was kind of like really triggering my anxiety. Mm, right? So okay. it was not just all smooth sailing. Uh, there yeah. was a lot. Mm -hmm. There was a lot uh, of challenge there. Challenge, and, but did you feel that at least some parts of the co course redeemed because they were more aligned with what you were, or it was all like stress level like this? How no, no, you... it was for, for me, it, they, they, there certainly was some sort of stress level. But for me, as I said, it was the first time that I had even uh, uh, encountered a context in which there is such a thing as as personal practice and practicing and and working like actual like working on something and having an aim like the word aim that like Robert Fripp used then back then or still uses probably. Uh, and it's just a very normal word. I had never heard that in my life. Like mm. my my parents never never asked me about my aims. There was not. It was not something that was kind of like in the in the matter in the sphere of of what they were thinking about, or even in school. Like I didn't have a name, a name. Like, like the aim in terms of a target, the finality of something, a desire to just, have a just, completion. Just could, just could could also be like a small term aim, but I never I was never thinking in those in that term. Like I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had absolutely no direction. And then in guitar craft, I was I was presented with this idea that you could have sort of like a direction. You still don't need to know how to get from A to B, but at least you know that you would like to get to B. Right. I, at least you at least you utter that you want to be at B. Yeah. Okay. And and and, and that is that was completely... then you march towards B because yeah, but that was completely of... yeah, but that was completely that was completely new to me that you could verbalize um, a vision, let's say, right? Oh. And and you know, like I, I don't know, but I I feel like I was pretty much a late late bloomer, and I still feel like a late bloomer because some of these really basic concepts uh were like i said there was there weren't many people that were teaching me mm -hmm. right or maybe and, not teaching you in a way that you could process on on your own maybe you are yeah. different right so maybe maybe it was taught and some people caught the message but it was not taught in a yeah. way that you could yeah. uh, grasp yeah. and you being different uh, uh could be part of that um different everybody's different but there's different scales of different <laughs> but you know it could be that for you the the typical uh, teachings or just the basic being in class just been it's interesting it's interesting it's yeah. it's quite it's quite possible it's possible that i um you know i wasn't um uh, it, that there was some sort of attention deficit involved in or you my, were not it, equipped it, to catch those lessons the way they were taught it just didn't fit maybe i don't know yeah you know but the inter the interesting thing is like i really i mean i have to say that i think that at least the first few years there in high school well starting with the fifth grade um there was no good teacher mm. there, there really was no good teacher i think that the school didn't give give us the good teachers okay yeah because of the g group and exactly down there exactly yeah. and it's really it's really uh um because you know this is the funny thing is like even though i may have not caught the message i may have had some sort of attention deficit i was like probably dreaming sleeping 
all day in, in school, uh, but I was always one of the best still. Mm -hmm. yeah. So like, like my, uh, my grades at the end of, um, of high school, they were all great. Like I, I, had the, I had the same grade in everything, at everything. Yeah, and we talked about that. And how do you, uh, what do you do with that? So you don't have any place that comes out either as a skill or an interest. Yeah. It's everything. Yeah. But did you have an interest in anything in school? Uh, forget the grades, which means you can perform yeah. broadly. Did you have something that interested you? No, in, in fact, it was certainly it was certainly music. It was okay. uh, already, yeah. Pedagogy and it was uh, informatics slash mm -hmm. math mathematics, which which I kind of like enjoyed. So it's it was already pretty pretty clear what my interests were. Yeah, yeah. funnily okay. enough, um, but I had not considered, and I was not considering that I I, I wanted to actually study informatics or like it was or mathematics i was not interested in that because for some reason i felt like i had understood the basics well enough so that i could imagine what would come next mm. and, and if if i have that sort of like sense i get bored i don't i don't want to deal with like, you know yes of course i can learn more about the kind of thinking let's say Yes, but, but I must say, though, I told you about my my brain gasm that I had. And I was in college at that point at the university level. And I had taken, I don't know, eight advanced math classes. And suddenly it's like, whoa, <laughs> it was a surprise. It was like everything. It really was a brain gasm. I remember where I was sitting. I remember the teacher. I just remember. So yeah, so maybe no, no, I'm, no I, I, I agree. No, no, no. I, 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 that is. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right with what you're saying. Um, and I also had those those brain gasms. I even had one where I had an out of body experience. Um, so it was pretty intense. But I had it more. I had it in a different context. Okay. And and it was and it was by uh, by reading. Um, reading uh, Douglas Hofstetter and um, and Carlos Castaneda, you know, like that, those were the, uh, the, 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 the brain gasm in, in inducing drugs, let's say, <laughs> yes. uh, and the music and, and the frip thing. And like, you know, yeah. and I know, and I know, and this is, this is not the point that I was trying to make, but, the, and I think we talked about that. I, I then sh chose psychology because uh, because maybe maybe just the text in that book that I was flipping through was just a bad text, right? But anyway, but it left the taste. Why did you go to college when you know you want music? And so that that's the question I was uh, coming okay. in this podcast. Uh, okay. with. Why did you even go and do a degree? Okay, it's it's pretty pretty easy. It was both my high school teacher mm. and and Robert Fripp, who very specifically said. Do not study music. Do not make it a professional thing oh. uh, in your life. It's gonna be. It's you know. They, they, Rip was very clearly saying, if you if you are if you are a musician, you're gonna do it anyway. So you yeah. might as well okay. you might as well learn something where you can make a living. Okay. Right, and that do you was. Think that... He gave that advice to other people as well. Is that? Yeah, he gave it. He, yeah, he gave yeah. it. He gave it to the. Don't the put all group. your eggs into this uh, yeah. passion. And okay. Yeah, yeah. He was. He was very. And that was reasonable. like. I have to still have to say very reasonable. Like some of the best advice I've ever gotten, and and really, um, my my high school teacher said the same thing. It was amazing, yeah. like, uh, and uh, this is another story that I've I've told people before, but. My high school teacher, Karl-Heinz Strittmanns, he was an amazing teacher, amazing composer. He like uh, uh, knew so much and he passed all his knowledge on to me, right? In these uh, two and a half years that we worked together. Um, and at the, the very last meeting I had with him, it was for his retirement. He um, actually, he actually sat down with me and he said to me, Marcus, do not go study music. Please be a composer. 
please do please do what i did not do in my life that's wow. what he said and he was the greatest teacher you know like about teaching for him stopped him from doing the things that he would have liked to do mm -hmm. and that was that was such a such a powerful emotional message that he gave me and it was in tune with what robert tripp said to me yeah. so at that point you know, there was oh, there was one third element, which is like interesting that I don't think I've ever mentioned before. Um, in order to go to conservatory in Germany, you would have to have uh, 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 ear training lessons. Okay. And ear training lessons, I didn't go to, not because I didn't want to do the ear training, but because I had the anxiety problem back then. So okay. I, like in my music school, these ear training classes, they were offered. I never went there because of social anxiety. Oh. So for me, then learning from both, both Karl Heinz and Robert to say, okay, don't go study music. I was and very relieved. Cool. Yep. Yeah, I was okay, very I relieved. Have to do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and that, that's it. And so- uh, So you see, there's a place here, maybe where the anxiety played a positive role. You see, we we're talking about that. It's not yeah. just all, right? It, no, 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 it was, yeah. 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 <laughs> and and so for me, uh, you know, I was a, awake enough to understand um, that these older men have knowledge to share and have wisdom to share, and I took took what they said seriously. But you also believed that they they saw they wanted the best for you. It was not, you know, it was they were sharing because they were generous, not because yeah, they, yeah. they did. Yeah. It's... Yeah. And that that was that was obvious to me that they were me well meaning well <clears throat> and more than that, right? It was actual wisdom that they shared, hmm. and uh, like coming from experience, because like like Robert, like a professional musician with lot of lots of experience in the music business. Like he he knows he knew and he knows what he's talking about, and and Karl Heinz as the successful teacher, you know who produced lots of great musicians, let's say, but himself he was very unhappy and it, I I was so um, you know again lucky that he actually shared his feelings with me, you know. Yeah, and no, that's uh, yeah. And it's interesting because like this this lineage. I, this is another thing that I was not aware of um, for many years, for decades even, um, that in, uh, in, in teaching, right, there is a lineage of teachers. And, and then at some point I started realizing, ah, okay, so, so Karl Heinz mentioned Harald Gensmer to me, like this composer, and then I, what, uh, and Harald Gensmer was a student of Paul Hindemith. And, and so, you see the uh, and parenthood. And yes, the yes, parenthood. Yeah. And then I realized, yep. okay, that's why I compose like that. That's why I have this kind of worldview about music. And, you know, because it comes from that guy, right? And, and uh, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. And then, like, even, even to see myself as an artist within that lineage, I feel, I feel humbled, right? I still feel yeah. super mm -hmm. humbled. <laughs> Because like it's just like it's two generations, and there was actually a really like a great, 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 great composer that's still recognized at this day, right? So um, yeah. No, I, I yeah I, I understand. It's it's funny in academia. There's there's some people talk about this sometimes, but yeah, if I look at the lineage, uh, yeah, I'm humble too. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it's it's an engineering, but it's hey, yes, humbled, humbled, absolutely, and you know, it's it's interesting. So then you okay, so you went and you studied psychology, mm -hmm. and. And what in psychology, there's a multitude of classes and all that. What resonated with you the most, do you think? You talk about pedagogy quite a bit. Um, yeah. Uh, so. yeah, you know, there, there are so many disciplines and really the clinical psychology didn't, wasn't really that interesting to me. Okay. It, 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 you know, it turned out that I had some sort of um, like intuitive knowledge about that and that I, I can be a good therapist like if i have to right uh, but that was never my main interest so i was okay. i was more interested in the in the science of psychology um so the experimental designs methodologies right and uh, statistics and 
that side of things was what it, what interested me most. And so the the, the groundwork, the research, and yeah. uh, and and it really, uh, you know, like it, you know, also the the university was kind of like uh, the how do you say like the focus of the department was on experimental psychology as well. Oh, that's great. Yeah, no, it's very yeah. interesting. It's fascinating. Yeah, and yeah. it's it's uh, it's the University of Bielefeld. Um, really, really good. Um, I, I felt I felt it was good there. You know, it was also at the time when it was still the. Uh, it was before they introduced the bachelor and master's system here. Okay. Uh, right. So it was still the old uh, way, and it's called. Uh, you know, the um, title is diploma. So I'm a yeah, okay. diploma psychologer, right? It's the, it's my title, mm -hmm. um, and so the um, it was very very. Uh, how should I say? Uh, a lot of stuff I had to learn. Like it was was you know I I think I I uh, added up the pages the numbers of pages I had to read in those I I, I managed to read it in six years. There were other people who took them 10 years or 11 years to go through this. Oh. It's what 60,000 pages, I think it was. <laughs> and, and you know, it was really like that because you didn't really have to go to the, uh, um, um, yeah, the class, find the word. The the, yeah, the class, yeah, the, or the, you know, the, the, um, in the auditorium where there's mm -hmm. the, but you didn't really have to be there. It was up to you if you wanted to like learn it from, being there or if you would just want to read the book mm -hmm. right and so for me um in the end it turned out that i really uh learned most of the things i had to know for the tests uh from the books but then i was not even reading the books myself i was actually leading groups study groups and i i managed to let the others read it for me somehow <laughs> So, so you did, so this, you know, this theme of not doing my own homework kind of like con continued even throughout uh, university. Uh, hey, we share this, okay? When I was in, in university, I told you I started to study. And um, before I developed skills really to learn to study because I had no clue how to do that. I would go like a few days before the exam in the cafeteria and there were tables of people and they were doing problems and I would sit there and then they <laughs> would do problems and oh well yeah what about this and then we discuss stuff and it was I was learning by discussing the problems and seeing where they got stuck and and helping each other and in the end it became that I didn't know how to study I would just go to ca cafeteria and be asked questions and then oh well i don't know uh let me see <laughs> and then and i was a way to learn so we have we have that uh yeah yeah and, and <laughs> like my, my my skill was to kind of like bring everything together right so like people people could um ask me questions about things that they had read yeah. uh and, and i was answered, i yeah. i yes yeah. and i answered their questions not having read uh mm -hmm. With this, like it's it's amazing, but that's sort of like what I what I was good at, right? And <laughs> it's 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 kind of funny, but you know. And I I remember I was um, um, actually living with with my girlfriend back then, and she was she was extremely um, helpful in this sense because she was very organized. She had like she had all the books, and back then you had to go copy copy texts from from books like you know like from the library of the, the library university. and yeah, yeah no, and yeah. and you like even like they physical like the, books <laughs> they eat even like the the micro microfish and stuff like that and i was i was just not organized enough to get that under control so she did all that but then wow. like like we together and with a few other people we had these study groups and I remember it was like maybe the first one and a half years, which were pretty easy at university. But then it started and it was like, like learning and like tests and stuff like nonstop for yeah. so for five years, almost five years. Wow. And, yeah. and I also wrote my my thesis with my, my master thesis really, which but but again, it was not like a master thesis nowadays, it's like 80 pages or something. But mine was 500 pages. 
And so it was a different time then. It was like yeah, the, uh, different it, school system. This different system, and they they were really <clears throat> asked. They were really like basically asking for more. Uh, oh. I'm not saying that's better or worse, but it was just just insane, an insane amount of stuff to study. Um, but I have to say, it was like even though I think like I I I forgot most of the uh, the facts, right? But the um, I still know a lot about the history of psychology, um, even if I don't know the the year, the number, you know, like was it 1809 or 1811? I can't. And that's remember. not important but, but, because you yeah. can find that information. Yes. It's easy yeah. to find. It's not yeah. critical, but the, the, I'm sure that there's a shadows of information that are still there. I don't remember all the ways to do, you know, certain things in engineering. There's same in math or whatever. But I know how to find it, and I have the broad skill set and the thought process, right? That's kind of you know the the oral the oral tests they were like that though. So I think it was like a, maybe a thirty minute slot, and you were there, uh, you know, with like two people that were the uh, that were testing you, right? And they were asking questions, and and i think there were maybe there was maybe time for five questions or something in 30 minutes and it was like the first four were just they were just asking about facts so in oh, in, in which so year, learning yeah in learning which in, 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 yeah because they just needed to find out if i had studied if i had read the book if i had learned about like in which year did freud first mention dreams like yeah. I don't know, but like questions like that, right? And then you would have to say something about that. And they, it was only the fifth question or the last question, which is sort of like interesting, where you had to have your own opinion or thoughts, thoughts yeah. or, mm -hmm. or you would have to make connections or stuff, something like that. So it was pretty pretty predictable. And but it it meant that even though I was kind of pretty good at you know like talking, let's say, and making connections right away, but I also had to learn the facts. And that's why, um, like the road learning, yeah, as you said, that was that was a big part of uh, five years of my life. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, and uh, you know, I have, to, I have to say this, I was, um, I went, I got through it okay, uh, pretty um, undamaged, I think, because I was, I was so happy making music at the same time. So what, uh, what Robert Fripp said to me that like, okay, do something else. The music will kind of like bal always balance out, you know, the the shitty stuff you have to do. Mm -hmm. He was he was absolutely right about that, and so it wasn't it wasn't that difficult for me to actually learn a lot, because I was happy, I was balanced, because I had my instrument, I was making, I you know, I I started uh, making recordings uh, as early as I. Uh, in the same year that I started uh, at university, I started in, in '93, and that was the year when I recorded my first my first release, wow. which was actually called "Ice Ice Closed." Ice closed. Was the I name. haven't seen that. Uh, no, there are there are there are actually five tapes I released okay. before my first CD, which are not oh. out there, and at some point I I may make Digitize them. Digitize or or yeah. Or... Yeah, I can't remember. I think they. I may have digitized them, but in like bad MP3. Poor quality. So, yeah. So I, I may have to go back and find the originals. <clears throat> oh, that's so cool. Mm -hmm. So you finished your degree, mm -hmm. and then uh, you continue to continue to play music through, and then uh, now you you're doing music, right? That's that's what you do. Well, that that is a very very simplified. <laughs> I know, but that's why happened. I'm asking. <laughs> that's why I'm asking. <laughs> no, no, it was there. You know, a lot, a lot happened. So, so you see, um, like I said, um, normally uh, the studies of psychology would would take people something like seven, seven to nine years, and for some reason, I was quick. I think it was, like I said, it was because I was making music on the side. Mm -hmm. um, so it's rather quick, and I I can't remember now when I actually got my degree. Um, it might might have been in early two thousand, but I was aiming at getting it still still getting it in ninety nine. So I had I handed in my my thesis in ninety nine. Um, 
so because for me it was important to to do it in sixth year somehow i just didn't want to before the seven <laughs> yeah before the seven you know that's i wasn't thinking about that back then but but somehow i just wanted i wanted to be done with it you know and and so um yeah or maybe it was it was i think it was probably late 98 that i handed it in and i got the degree in in april 99 i think um, and so it, it, it was really, it's a degree, but it's actually a title, right? So I'm, I'm allowed to, to, to have this title, which I have, uh, I rarely use. Um, but anyway, so yeah, what happened then? So there was, um, a, f a friend, um, that I also partnered up with for the, for the, our, um, uh, thesis. And like, we were both working on related subjects and um and so we, we we became good friends and we started um our first business together which only um we only had that business for a year but it was called open the door uh um the the feedback agency so the idea was actually like something really progressive something that you could do nowadays but you couldn't do like tw over 20 years ago uh you would you would offer artists psychological uh, um, like coaching um, and and actually li literally like the idea of the feedback agency was was that was my idea is to like okay anybody could come to me and ask me for an opinion no matter okay. what any any subject anything so it doesn't have to be the like purely the clinical psychology world but you know, like some some painter could come and ask me, okay, what do you think about this, right? This is and so funny. They, yeah. Why? <laughs> because because it's I had this dream of of starting when I moved to California and I was searching what what the heck am I gonna do and I was thinking about going back in lighting and whatnot and I was like, you know what? I think I'm gonna open an agency. I'm gonna call it consultant at large. Come mm -hmm. to me. You have an issue. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny yeah. because I had this theme developed. I didn't actually act on it, yeah. but it's like, yeah, because I then I worked for a lighting company and they were going through chapter 11, boom, whipped it all up. You know, all so it's funny. I that's the smart aspect thing part of me. <laughs> I think, yeah, that's yeah, I'll figure it out, you know. But it's so funny that you actually did it, and I, I so com yeah. completely relate. <laughs> yeah, consultant at it. large. <laughs> yeah, it, and it, I think I still think it's a great idea. And the, the, the mm -hmm. problem, though, is that, well, the problem, but at the same time, the strength is that most people don't understand that this would be a valid thing, that this would actually work, right? That, mm -hmm. there, that there are people who are sort of, um, and I mean, I was, I was 29, right? Or something like that, or like, or let me, let me calculate, no, 27, actually. 27, 28. That's, so. pretty, that's a smart ass thing to do. It but is you know what? Nowadays, it, there's life coaches. It's yeah. kind of similar, right? A lot of them yeah, are, don't have a psychological training. They help people with business, their whatever, even retirement yeah. fund, yeah. personal things. It's it's kind of kind of like that. And, yeah. and you know that's you know that's what that's but that the funny thing is that's what I've been doing all my life. All my life up to that point like people always came to me for advice or for you know like because they knew there's this guy who who simply says something a genius. like no 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 i think it's i really i really you. no 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 i think i think it's really about something else i think that uh, all of us can take that role mm -hmm. but only but only very few have the balls or the yeah, yeah, uh, the the confidence the confidence to actually say the things like mm -hmm. I think we like no matter what you can just put any person in front of me or Christine, right? And we would have to say uh, something to say. Yeah, like we would no. we would see something, right? And absolutely. And, and yeah. I think everybody sees something in other people, but they don't dare to say what they see. And this is this is sort of like the uh, a skill that I always had, and and that's why that was the business idea. And obviously, it, oh, it makes sense. It, it, and it didn't it didn't work out the way it was. Uh, planned initially but it turned into sort of like a, a, a management training thing that we did for a year so we had a, a maybe a handful of clients where we did um, um, weekend seminars with them uh, about 
you know communication skills uh, creativity that kind of that kind of field mm. of psychology and it was um it was it, i think we were good i mean we were young but we were good and um so that was the beginning that was like the, my first um freelance work and uh uh, then that kind of like turned into something completely different because I had um, met a guy um, that I played music with, who was a graphic designer, who is a graphic designer. And we started a new business together in 2000, in early 2000, um, which basically was sort of, sort of like a miniature uh, advertising agency. That's different. That's it, quite it's different, different, but it's quite different, but not so much because the idea was okay. Here is like one one guy who knows about the uh, visual communication, and there's the other person who knows about communication, right? And we wanted to to offer the special the special package, let's say, which also mm -hmm. like as it turned out worked, right? Like we found we found that one big client relatively early on, actually via a contact. Hey, this is funny because we and this is this is really super funny remember that i said i went to the robert fripp show there in uh 91 mm -hmm. in that in that <laughs> same venue 10 years later i met we met that guy that introduced us to our biggest client oh. it was it was the same venue and 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 that that big client we had for like six or seven years and what we did is we developed um, uh, a visual, a visual, but also, also, well, yeah, but mostly the visual language for people in the in the food industry, um, because this this company we worked for was selling uh, software, uh, customer relationship software, basically, um, for the food industry in Germany. And food industry basically meant uh, like 99% of their customers was was meat production. Okay. Right. So so really, uh, and you, as you can imagine, uh, like even if you have like big big companies that produce meat, let me just use these words. Um, uh, basically, the, the people that started those companies were farmers. So the challenge was to find a language uh, to with icons and stuff. Yeah, and yeah, colors, so. and colors to to kind of make them understand what kind of product they were buying. Okay, right? so In a more so, intuitive way than uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it was it was basically we were kind of like the interface between the software designers and and the customer, which were farmers, like rather like not super intelligent people, let's say. Not, so it's really not, the interface uh, for communicating, yeah, yeah. For selling, for, okay. for mm -hmm. selling software, right? Mm -hmm. And we were pretty successful at that. I think we we kind of like developed this really uh, straightforward, but also pretty strict system with which um, the the well the company that we worked for had to, like we created the. Um, Yeah, yeah that's sort of like an identity also for them obviously but then like the, this this whole language and it was like it was ugly like some of the some of the, the the you know the products we had to design they they looked pretty ugly but they worked mm. you no know, we used lots of brown yeah the beige kind of like you know colors not so much like green um, mm. yeah but then, you know but then but then there was but then there was a field where we used you know there was a series of products where we used green yes, yes and then later yes. on but there was the, the meat. there was the blue <laughs> yeah for the meat it was the the brown and yellow and the kind of stuff and the red yeah. and and yeah but it, it really it really works you know it was uh, and we were pretty pretty successful at that and and um yeah but that lasted till the um Till the financial crisis in 2008 mm. and at that point like there was like a lot of uh, people basically stopped uh, marketing uh, mm. for here in, in Germany at least and uh, that was the point when we lost uh, our main our main client and mm. basically then decided and kind of like learned the hard way 
that we uh, wouldn't be able to find a replacement mm. for that for that client. But you did that for several years. Yeah, it was again. It was um, it was seven years. All along, while you still two thousand one to two thousand eight. Yeah, this was so basically the idea of like starting the business with with my partner Bernhard was that we we knew that what we wanted to make was art and that mm -hmm. nobody was going to pay us for our art. Yeah. So yeah. the idea was, OK, so let's just have our own company where we can and let's find a, a, a model where we can take money out of the company to pay for our art. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to become our own patrons. That was yeah. that was really what we were saying. Um, you know, the German word for patron is, is very nice. It's made sane. It's oh, a, really? That's interesting. It yeah. sounds like uh, medicine, yeah. yeah. But well, you wanted your, to be your own boss. Our yeah. own boss and like wanted and to, to earn our own money for, for yeah. supporters to, to, do, yeah. to make our art. And so the, the idea was never to kind of like be successful or to make money with... with Just with make music. enough money so you can sustain and finance yes. your art. Yeah. Yes, but but what happened then, and this I think is a main feature, and this is something that also I'm I'm uh, I think I'm sharing for the first time. What happened is that we sort of like start like the um, the production quality of what we were doing, and I'm not talking about production as in. I think like like just the the fact that we took every every part of the process very seriously, meant that we we kind of like we created hilarious uh, out there music and we packaged it and talked about it in a way as if it was, if, as if it was a marketable product. Okay. So, 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 you know, like, and the idea of actually having our own money to spend meant that we could actually go have a great mix, have a great uh, uh, mastering. And we, you know, we went to London to master some of the most experimental albums we ever, ever did. Like, so it was kind of crazy, but it also meant that we were taking ourselves very seriously. And, and the products, the, you know, the, the CDs, they, they look super high quality and they still like, also the design was great, you know, because Bernard is a designer. And, and so basically what started happening was that the, the way that uh, the, uh, the image that got projected outwards was way ahead of where we were as people. Okay, yeah, uh -huh. right. And so I, you were top-notch professional in the all the packaging, the delivery, and the production. Yes, yes, yeah. and and this this has been also a theme that like some sometimes like there was a guy who visited me and um, he um, and he said to me like when he met me he thought I was fifty six and like from <laughs> from the way that I had that I was writing and stuff like that. So, so there was, it was interesting, you know, it was also the beginnings of the internet where really, really, you didn't, you really didn't know, you had no idea who you were writing with, right? No, like that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah you don't so, know. and, mm -hmm. and, and so coming out of that scene, basically, uh, where a very experimental uh, pieces of art, music, were packaged in a, a professional way and presented and then sort of like, badly but still marketed in a professional way mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of like what we what we what we what we became yeah and and then we sort of like um i don't think that i've ever caught up with uh with my image somehow i don't know <laughs> Oh, maybe, maybe I did. Maybe I have eventually. That's but... funny. That's funny. Well, at yeah. 42, yeah. you obviously uh, hit something there. So you caught up and it's like, I've done it all. No, I'm, I'm, I'm being, uh, yeah. yeah. That's funny. That's very interesting. I had no idea about this, uh, th this part. Of, I, I know you as a musician. I don't know you much, but I like your music. I like the creativity you have. Uh, it, it's interesting and also like the I couldn't find a word to describe some of the, the music that you do mm -hmm. yeah. I only have a word in French and I, I looked up in English it doesn't work and it's very interesting because you have a mix of, uh, of uh, I'm kind of switching gears a little bit talking about your music okay. because I think it's interesting uh, mm -hmm. he, you play things that are um, and it Whatever I say, it's meant as positive in a discordant 
melody, melodies, metal, melodic way. It's really, it's a controlled discordance in a yeah. lot of the music that you do. And, and it's very interesting. And the word that comes to mind is lugubre, which is a kind of eerie, but not quite. It's dark. It's how, do you, how do you spell it? L-U-G-U-B-R-E. L-U-G-U-B-R-E. And it, ah, okay. it came yeah, up as dismal. And it's not, that's not no, the word. Lugubre yeah, no. is more like eerie, but yeah, yeah. richer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, the the German the German translation is dusta, which makes sense, sort okay. of like a, a, a variation of the word dark. Yeah, dark, uh, yeah. rich, and yes, yes, and uh, but dark is kind of negative, right? So it's not. Yeah, yeah, it's, no, no, yeah. yeah. So, but I, but I know I know what you mean. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's sort of like like I say, that's sort of part of my my lineage, I would say. Mm. Um, so I'm I'm sort of. Um, Kind of in, like musically, because like like I said, my teacher Karl Heinz, he sort of he uh, led us through the um, the eras of music, right? So old music, uh, baroque, yeah, you know, like all all these phases up until like the new music of the tw of the twentieth century, mm. and 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 so I was I was interested in the music that sort of like happened until the Second World War. Okay. And and really, then the Second World War sort of like put a big big dent in things, obviously. And then after, something new started, which sort of like I also I also kind of like soaked up as a European. And um, but what was really interesting to me was the music of the and the musical achievements that were made until like the mid thirties, let's say. Okay. Right? And so and so like from for. From my from my point of view, I was always interested in building that bridge that went from before the war to now. Mm. And now with now, I actually mean now. So that in the in the nineties, that was that now, right? Yeah, so yeah. I always wanted to bring some of that into into what I was doing at the time. So so I have this. You could say like I have this this uh, traditional knowledge. That's how I would call it. And um, like the uh, almost like a folklore kind of folklore, yeah, mm -hmm. kind yeah. of knowledge, folklore. right? Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And that's and and that has always been like very important to me to kind of like bring that old folklore into the present, and and that mm -hmm. and that is sort of like part of that sound that you're hearing. Um, it's also like this this idea um, that. Um, there is no such thing as as atonality, as atonality, right? Mm -hmm. There's 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 only there's there's only free tonality. So meaning I can be free with tonality, right? Yeah. So but there's always going to be something that sounds tonal because that's just how our our uh, uh, our system of perception works. That we try yeah. to put things we in context. process. Something. Yeah, and yeah. they get, they get yeah you know, like it's just just a simple simplest explanation is like everything's getting related to the lowest note somehow, mm -hmm. right? So that means there's there's always tonality, and yeah. but 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 my um, uh, my and in your case the base tone is is kind of the it's I see this as the the I don't even know what it's called in English but the the staff on which your mu music carries you have to. The low frequencies and it's oftentimes uh, repetitive, almost like EDM. Yet mm -hmm. that sets the tone, and then the rest happens with yeah. you know above it. And it's yeah. it's, but it's very different. It's a, it's very it's a signature sound, and it transpires in Stickman. It transpires in different places, and it's yeah. it's uh, interesting. But now that you've mentioned your folklore and the origin of that. I, I'll try to listen to it differently and see because it, that's not something I would have gotten out of it because it's so far from what what you know I, I could think of. It's not something I was aware. Yeah. See if I, I can see that in it. But yeah, you, you know this is this yeah. this is um, how should I say this? You know, um, I think I have a really good mixture of of uh, being intuitive and cerebral. Mm -hmm. Like I can, I can do both, and I can bring both together. 
right? And this is this is like a big um, a big thing, right? Like to to be able to just um, you can be intellectual, but at the same time, you take materials that have been around forever. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And, and, and that, um, and you know, like, like obviously, I, and, and I thank you for saying that it kind of like shows in, in all sorts of different projects that I do. Obviously, oh, does, yeah. obviously, I, 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 I'm always trying to find like the right approach. So with Stickman, it's a little bit of that, but obviously, I also take from what Pat and Tony offer, right? And then mm -hmm. I just, so it's- They both have a very uh, clear roles as well, you, but we can hear the, the three sounds, uh, you know, they, they're there. It's really a good blend, but yeah. I was not as familiar as your sound, uh, to your sound, uh, yeah. as for say, you know, more Tony and I've listened yeah. to you in multiple yeah. projects and then Pat and King Crimson, it's, that's the there's a novelty there that comes from from your instrument yeah, and i'm exactly. not trying to flatter you it's just no 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 it's a no. good, it's a good mix so no, i know what this, you mean because it's yeah. it's for me for me it's like a, I, a word comes to mind now it's this i'm tr i'm when i'm working with other people what i try to do is to recontextualize what they mm -hmm. do like so that's because if i don't do that i don't feel the need to actually be there somehow no because they have their own thing going and it's working but that brings me to the question is, so you collaborate with a lot of different people. You have your own sound, you're, you, you seem to really know what you want. How do you make that work? So it cannot be <clears throat> dictatorship. It's, it's allowing creativity. So let me tell you the example when I, I lead projects in science, right? And I'm, I guess my best description of my role is I'm a technical integrator. Sometimes I have the vision, sometimes I borrow a vision from somebody and I kind of make it happen. And I really work with some of the smartest people in the world in my field. I mean, they're all parts of my team and it's, it's amazing, really the best. So it's always like setting a direction, letting room for creativity to come out. I have two postdoctoral researchers, they're geniuses in their own way. Three actually are super smart, have new ideas. You don't want to go and sidetrack too much because you're not going to achieve anything. It's this balance of, and you would think it's science completely different, but I think there's that in yeah. music as well. You don't want to stifle the creativity, but you need to have still a direction and kind of be the leader and, and, and take uh, things in. But at some point you have to say, okay, now we're moving on. And I'm thinking uh, with you guys, um, with all the people you work with, are how strong music, they're all strong musicians, they have their own styles. And all. How do you make that work? What makes a good collaboration? I'm really curious about that. Mm -hmm. uh, can you, you know, expand on that yes. experience? <clears throat> yeah. yeah, so first of all, obviously there is no, not one answer here. Uh, I think it's really about um, applying yourself differently depending on who you work with and also what the project is. Mm -hmm. And then also, um, and, and, you know, as a project or as a manager of people, you, you will know I'm talking about sometimes the best way is not to do anything, right? Mm -hmm. so, so only only the fact that you are at the top of the, well, let me just say at the top of the tree or whatever. Yeah, let, let's not, point, yes, in terms, but, but you know, but you know what I mean? Just in terms of like, say, responsibility, for example. Yeah, exactly. Right? In the end, right? it's ownership. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so you're there, but just the fact that it's you, is already enough mm. so, so you wouldn't even have to do anything and 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 things things would would carry your name like the results will carry your spirit and will carry your um you know you don't have to control things for to, something to, to, yeah. to, to be to be a result of your presence let's say and that's, this that, has to happen, but you have to be known for something. And I'm talking in general sense here, not, not about me or you necessarily, but you have to be known for something so that the, the impregnation of that the flavor is in, is in the team. Yes, yes but, but that can, like when we're talking about collaboration, like musical collaboration, what it comes down to is mutual respect of the people mm -hmm. that collaborate yeah. with each other. So there you go. So that then means that my name right like the fact that i collaborate will certainly 
color the the product if we just want to call it product the result mm -hmm. of the work right so um but obviously like in practice um it 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 actually means uh sometimes it means it can mean like even fighting for an idea or yeah. uh -huh. or or you know sometimes like i said like like uh, going back to the anxiety theme right like sometimes um taking the harder making music the hard way is something that has been said to me and others in my in my family of musicians right like we're making music the hard way because there is some we see some merit in going the extra mile mm -hmm. right so that's one way that can happen so like um, with certain people that I've, I've worked with over the years I can I can tell you exactly on that album I actually tried to do something that he didn't understand okay but I made him do it and I made him accept it okay like, even though it was beyond his musical horizon right okay and vice versa, I guess it's the same way. You follow right? the so I follow, okay. I followed and I said, I okay, no, I'm just I'm just not not gonna give you anything that's challenging. I'm just gonna give you whatever you what I, where I know that it's gonna be easy for you to work with. And I'm I and I'm I'm not gonna question the quality of the of the work because the output, I yeah. Didn't, mm -hmm. yeah. So I and and so this is also why for me it's uh, it is very important to actually consume my own work. Mm, and I okay. and to do that and to do that over over decades, right? So I, it's important for me as sort of like a an act of hy hygiene, even right? To to uh, to listen to the old stuff I've done, to listen to all the collaborations I've done, and to to learn to appreciate them, and to learn to enjoy them, and to learn to listen to them as if I wasn't involved in them. Yeah, uh, uh, as a spectator, really yes. absorbing yes. and seeing. Mm. Yes, yes. Because I'm and sure that sometimes if somebody fights for their point that you don't see, but you just say, well, I'll go along because it's my turn to follow <laughs> or whatever. I'm just yeah, simplifying. Sure. But after that, I'm sure you, you probably discover, you know what, this was the right call. Or I, I learned something. No, here I, I actually, you know, I actually appreciate that a lot if, I, if I'm being... Uh, pushed in a different direction it's actually what i'm looking for mm. in life also right so in in in, let's, in life but like i mean like music musical life uh and it's it's hard it's hard to find people that kind of like have a but i i have some collaborators who are like that and which is great so because that means i can just say i trust you like i give you this material and i know whatever you're going to do with it uh, it's going to be great and mm. and there has there have been very little if if any disappointments uh, for me and this is uh, this, I th yeah we were talking last time a little bit about the emotional attachment to certain pieces and so on and how does that play or do you even have it or not when you collaborate with people and you might be attached to something uh, for reasons are beyond cerebral there are just there could be a passion with the something you really want to get this out I, I guess in a way you can say well i'll keep it for the next project or something but i mean no. do you are you sometimes emotionally torn about some of those choices musically or it's more no not, no, not really no. i you know i'm I'm not the kind of person who um, not so not, not very concerned with the past. Let's say uh -huh. it's uh, it's it's interesting. Like again, like my friend Bernard, uh, who knows me for for 25 years now, he also says like he he envies me because I'm I'm sort of the kind of person who forgets things that are not important. And he says, yeah, but in the present, you might have this this uh, this dissonance in your own emotions of something and making a decision you're not happy with i'm not even talking about the past uh, yeah, yeah 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 no no it's it it really um i don't know i i think it's just a matter of uh um again it's about it, it really is about the people that you work with mm -hmm. i have to say and and that's that's where where uh, a bad decision could be made but once mm -hmm. once the once 
you know the collaborators are like you know that's your team right you don't question and you don't regret um i don't at least right i do not regret any decisions that are being made in that process because i have committed to the team right that's yeah. that's how i see it yeah, so yeah. that's that if so that and and I have made maybe just a, a well even there I wouldn't say that it's a mistake but I've had some some teams that say that broke up like maybe maybe I don't even know in my whole career maybe like two okay. people that I've had like bad experiences with where I would but even then looking at the work we did together the work is un, untouched by the by the human element let's the say the difficulty just 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 the problem that i'm that i'm dis, uh, uh, disappointed in a person does not mean that i don't appreciate the work yeah you and, can dissociate yeah the people yeah yeah oh, i've I, been uh, yeah. i understand that completely yeah, yeah absolutely but the mutual respect is important um the communication the the listening to others <laughs> i would assume yeah. is very important um and so do you have do you want to talk a little bit about your recording experience from last week or is it too fresh or i'm curious it is, to see it, is it is fresh yeah it's very it's very fresh um you know, so it was um you know this 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 band um is a trio like the album that really we released was under my name and featuring the other two guys oh, yeah i saw that uh -huh. so so the uh so fabio and asaf and um the album is called truce so the idea behind the title is uh is, is uh, there are many reasons why i call it truce the idea was sort of like to make make peace with myself um with regards to uh being a guitarist and being a performer so because that's that is an album where I actually like for the first time really I'm sort of like in a in the lead role and I mean the lead role as a as the guitarist if you listen mm -hmm. to the music now you hear that everybody's leading obviously but yeah. like for mm -hmm. me but for me it was just this this moment where I could be um just play right so I and not and not think I just play, just move my fingers. And you know, I've been hesitant to sort of like show people that I actually can play. There, you know, there's been like for many years, like people, people were saying, like, uh, well, saying, but like writing uh something about that I can't play. Um uh, yeah, it's it's I think it's be, it's, be, it's because of the it's because of the ambient music that I uh oh, that, yeah. I, uh -huh. that I started being uh known for. That was like the first thing I did, uh, but even back then I I, I could play. Um, you choose to I, make and and much music. exactly exactly. But people 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 some people don't understand that. And so for for me, um, I had this in uh, like in the early days of my uh, uh, time at university, I discovered Keith Jarrett, Keith Jarrett and his art of improvising. Um, you know pieces of music on the on the piano and that sort of like became my my aim and my idea that i was would be i wanted to be able to create pieces of music on the spot and, mm. and so truce was sort of like an extension of that where i could also be a soloist kind of creating with others um i I've, and the funny thing is like i've been do, doing that forever but with with the truth trio it was like this this special thing that uh, this permission to this be, permission to be yeah. to be a show off also in a way right i was wondering so truth was that pre-written or it's, it's a lot of it seemed improvised to me and i was like i wonder if they ever play this live ever or it's always going to no, be it's, that, it's, it's completely it's completely improvised 100 okay okay that's, that's the, the what it felt like you know the baseline is the baseline is something that Fabio played to us uh, and they said, okay, let's go for it. And then let's just play. And so okay. Fabio was, was sort of like the main, uh, the written element you could say, um, yeah. but then uh, playing with it freely. Yeah, and, and, and so you see that album has become quite popular and, and um, maybe, maybe my, my biggest success, I think in terms of sales and, um, 
And so the, the idea was to sort of like continue, sort of continue with that formula in a way, because we had, we had shows booked last year and we had studio dates booked for a second album last year. And I think it would have it would have turned out like we would have gone on stage, we would have had these bass riffs, and we would have had the sounds of the songs in our heads. And obviously, we, could, we couldn't have repeated different. the same thing. No. But mm -hmm. but 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 we would have had these templates, let's say, yeah, play, templates. right? Mm -hmm. So okay, so now fast forward to uh, a few days ago when we got together at uh, this uh, beautiful studio Ritmo e Blu in uh, Pozzolengo at uh, Lago di Garda in Italy. Um, we uh, started playing and we are immediately, we were back into, in that mode. And so we were, we were able to like kind of recreate those moods, those kinds of songs, like, just like this. The and chemistry was there. Chemistry, chemistry everything, okay. everything was there. So, but then what, what happened was uh, pretty amazing. So then it, it, it seemed as if everybody uh, it seemed like we didn't, we, it didn't feel right to do the same thing again, somehow. It was too similar. It was yeah, it was, it was too similar. It was too much like okay. you, we could tell that all our individual quirks kind of like started, you know, they were, they are making the sound. Right? You're going so, back to your old folds and yeah. In, in okay. a way, in a way. So, because like, if we had pl played this stuff live, I think we would have, uh, we would have probably felt more confident that we could could have stayed in the same mode but now with the uh, traumatic experience of the COVID times and the lockdowns and stuff um, we we then went for something much more intense and experimental in the end okay so we had we had two days that we were uh, playing right uh, and I can't, I don't even know how much music we really recorded. Like it wasn't, it wasn't 10 hours, but it was probably something like three or four hours, right? Of recorded music. Um, and then we, uh, you know, in the evenings, we started listening to what we had done during the day and we started making lists and no taking notes and stuff. And much to my surprise, like we chose, because like also the others, we chose the more difficult pieces. And it's uh, it's very interesting. It's it's super intense. It's uh, super virtuosic still, and um, but has much more of a, a, a post post rock vibe. And actually, the producer in the studio he actually uh, uh, went out and came with a with a Canadian city actually like Constellation Records uh, album uh, and said, "I listen to this because this is kind of the direction where we're going." It was interesting. So so oh, so there is. I don't know them. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. like a Godspeed, you Black Emperor, and bands that are sort of like, okay. yeah, but it's like Canadian post rock. Um, but anyway, it's uh, um, so it was. It came as a big surprise. It's almost cliche, right? Like you have you have these hard times, you know, of the virus, and you go to the studio, and some the music is more aggressive yeah. and more more it's tense. Like you needed to release. Uh, yeah, yeah, but, but whole but, year of uh... yeah, but yeah, but the funny thing is that we're pretty much aware that there is this this cliche that that might happen when you're. But we, but it turns out like we started playing and we we realized oh we 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 were quite capable of continuing what what we had done and then it was almost conscious. You wanted to, to do something to, else. We to do something else, right? So and I mean, so truth office... too is not really truth too. It's no, um, it's not. Very... It's... Yeah, it's okay. it's not so so but the idea was also for truth to be the name of the trio so okay. i because i had recorded a second album uh, at the same time we did truth one which was uh, the album oculus and yeah, so the I, so, yeah. so the idea like was the idea was that there's marcus reuter truth and marcus reuter oculus marcus reuter oculus so truth is the trio and oculus is a big band right yeah. so that was the was the idea so and and we shall see how it will be built in the end. I don't know. And what's the uh, title of the album going to be? I don't know. But um, so, are you part of the final producing? How do you guys do that? Because... Yeah, no, normal. Normally we are. And actually, okay. um, the bass player Fabio, he's one of the, the greatest music producers there is. Okay. I, I think I'm kind of okay. I'm good. Uh, I have, you know, I have, I have ways to make things sound okay. 
but uh, Fabio is better than I am. But even like Fabio said, so why don't we let this guy that we recorded it at, like this guy here in the studio, see what he want, he can make. See what he's of it. yes, and so that's that's where we're at at the moment. And it's it's, it's also it's an added layer of of creativity with the the raw sure. material. It's, for sure, it's nice. for sure, cool. and it's something I appreciate very much to kind of let go of the responsibility and and have somebody else be creative with it. So that's where we are at the moment. But it's also a budgetary question, um, mm. unfortunately. So um, and this this raises, I mean, like uh, we've all, already talked almost two hours, but like there's there's really a big challenge at the moment that I'm facing with getting projects financed. Because first of all, I'm, um, I've gotten uh, weary of asking for help. Mm. Um, I don't, I don't, it's like always being in, in beggar mode, right, is, is, has, you know, it really hasn't been good for my, for my emotional well being. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but it turns out that with, you know, selling music, uh, it's impossible to recoup any so yeah. and, and that that also means that any musical project i i make and now we get back to this again to the anxiety part so so the payoff i'm getting from making ma making my art has has been has been going down and down over the years and there's almost nothing left yeah so so and the so, cost of producing albums is, is is high even yeah well it's high it. or you do or you do everything yourself and then you don't count the actual work you're doing yourself as yeah. being a value and stuff and it's really it's it's become so difficult and and i have um you know like i'm not i'm it, you know this is also another thing that people get wrong you know it's not that i'm working on music all the time it's just that like i have these phases like go into the studio and i create music or I sit down here at my desk and and I record a new ambient album or something like that, right? But, but it, um, so, but in say the uh, whatever six months that have passed this year, um, I obviously did a few things, right? So, but I have not been uh, motivated to actually share with people that I've done the work that I did because I fear. Um, asking for help, asking for money, uh, begging again, like knowing that at this this day and time, if I release something, like people don't even notice anymore. Like for example, I re I released an ambient album, one a great great ambient. Album. It's Gratitude Part Two. Yeah, I saw I saw the announcement. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. Like nobody has, has even noticed. Like I can tell you, there's there's less than less than fifty people who've bought it. Okay. I'll buy it, so, but here's the thing: all those albums, you yeah. sell them and you suggest a price that's really low. Why? Why? No, no, no. I no, mean, no, you could no, have no, a no. higher pro margin on those, and it would be fair. I, I, no. yeah, I just think you undersell. Uh, the no, I don't. I don't. don't no, work. I don't undersell. It's it's no. uh no. I I, I can so tell cheap. you because yeah, but because but I don't go by what you think or what others think. I go by numbers. And okay. as a matter of fact, when I put a put a price tag on something, I'm not selling anything. Cool. If I if I give it away for free, I make something, and I always make more on free than on something that I put a price tag on. And because it's, people as, give a, their price, is that it? Or they, why? they you know because some people they understand they understand yeah. the process mm -hmm. they understand the situation, and they actually like there are people who actually pay a lot. Like mm. some people pay 150 euros mm. for an album because they know they support me, right? Yeah, yeah. So for, for example, this this podcasting, right? Like I'm doing it, doing that also as an investment, mm -hmm. right? And I, I I made a calculation like okay, so what is kind of like the minimum of of work investment that I put into this, right? Is is about like the minimum is about 250 euros per episode that I I kind of like. Would be Are you good saying if, if I should I would... pay you for inviting me? No, 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 <laughs> I'm no, not at all, not at all. But, but, but really, like, if you know, yeah. like, uh -huh. this is this is uh -huh. the, because it's sort of like an equivalent to the music. That's why I'm uh -huh. I'm uh, mentioning this. So it's like even if I would just to look at the work that I'm doing, not taking into account the artistic value of what I do, right? Uh, like even a podcast would have to cost 250 yeah. euro at least, 
right? At least. Yeah. So, so, but then, okay, I'm putting out 10 podcasts per month. Okay, so that means 2,500, okay? So, so how can I, you know, possibly how ever make 2,500? Monetize, or, or yeah. monetize this to be, okay, so, so what I've, and, and so what I've realized, and this is kind of like interesting, you know, like um, it, it was, it was, there was a really unfortunate event um, of cyberbullying that I had to endure on, uh, on Facebook where oh. somebody, where somebody started saying that I, a music podcast has more than 30 episodes and not, not one woman was on the, on the show. And this, and then there was like a, like, like, is you that don't why even you picked me? No, no, no. <laughs> I, you know, I had, I had you on the list from the very beginning. Oh, um, thank you. So no, no, what, no, what, what, um, um, Anyway, I don't even know now what. Uh, yeah, we're talking but, about the cyberbullying. Yeah. So what 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 happened was that. Uh, so I realized that first of all, people didn't even understand that I was doing this for myself, that mm -hmm. it's an art project, that it's not about discrimination at all. It's actually mm -hmm. the opposite of it, right? I I just choose the people I want to talk to because it's my interaction with it's my life but, it's an art project yeah, but who can judge you for what you decide to do i mean i i i really started to listen to those, those podcasts and they're great and they're fantastic and you know what they made me realize what has missed me what i've missed the most in the in the pandemic because i'm happy alone it's funny mm -hmm. because i go to conferences and all that people see me as a so social butterfly i'm just happy alone at home nobody i'm happy but i'm also mm -hmm. sociable uh, but the thing is what i realize is missing is the crossbreeding the discussion and you get to sometimes into philosophical discussions with a stranger again we we chatted about that on the plane and all this that are there's not people from your field and i have great conversations with some of my colleagues that are not even related to work but this yes. cross pollination these ideas so i really i really see the value of what you're doing for personal growth and but, but you see what what was the problem was and this i realized that it was misrepresent as a podcast about musicians oh. so that and that was the problem so but in, it was in, mostly musicians but yeah it's but it's not but it's it's people i know so it yeah, has nothing yeah, it has yeah. nothing to do with with musicians and and if you follow the conversations they're most they're not about music yeah, exactly you know? mm -hmm. so so anyway so it was just a little bit misrepresented and so but it sort of sort of made made me think but anyway so the like the crazy thing that happened that on that very same day a lady from switzerland contacted me and said that she wants to donate for the podcast Wow. At a considerable amount. Wow. That was that was so amazing. So like on one hand, there was I was being attacked for not having women on my podcast. And on the other side, there was a woman giving me money for says, my podcast. Yeah, I'll give you, I'll support you. Yeah. <laughs> it was, it was, it was. Uh, karma, a good karma. <laughs> yeah, but it was, you know, it was just, but it, it, it kind of like, um, you know, the question is kind of like, what kind of responsibility do I have to kind of like make sure like there was even the criticism that it was called MR podcast, which is the, my initials. Yeah. And people were oh, saying, it's Mr. Mr. And I'm just saying, oh, you should tell how... Pat that he should rename his, uh, his yeah, old ben. man, Madam, yeah. Madam. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it was, but it was just, just, I was, I was really, I have to say it really threw me off for a few weeks. This was but really you can't bad let those things affect you. No. I mean, I understand. It's just, it's, what no. do these people who criticize? What do they do for a living? What do they produce? What do they share with the world? That's the thing. It's so easy to be a critic, and uh, yeah. Yeah, no. but you, you say I shouldn't let the, those things affect. I know, me, but, they, but they do. I know. And, I know. And this is this is this is really where uh, where yeah, I don't know. I think it's. Um, yeah. So no, I. No, but I, yeah, I understand, I, and I, you know, rationally that you shouldn't let that. And plus, it's one person out of, out of you know how many. And but I know it's this. Yeah, the negative stuff we notice more than the, all the positive, and sometimes it, it yeah, yeah, it affects but, us. But but there you go. It's sort of, and this is the, now I, this is why I mention it. So the you know the the artistic work, 
like I, I know I'm doing this just for myself. I know I'm doing it just for myself. But somehow it also seems like it's what I'm doing for this, for the community. It's like what I'm, it's my contribution to this world somehow. So there should be some sort of awareness or some sort of way for, for me to be able to uh, get some sort of compensation. And then if something like, like the, the, the criticism happens that is completely out of line with what I'm doing and it hurts me, at that point, I'm starting to think like, what is the, like, what am I actually investing and what, what am I? Why do I go to? Yeah, why do I get yeah. out? So, like, so, so, and I know it's it's sort of like, yeah, it's me. I should like ignore that, and I should understand that it's not personal and stuff like that. I know, um, but, but it's no, just I not, it's not. It's not. It's not. It's not easy, and it's the same. Like I, you know, like it's like sometimes when I see music reviews, where people say, so, so, you know, and and they have no idea what the artist does. They don't mm -hmm. know that what the artist does is is what they are capable of doing at the time of doing that and and just just the fact that somebody has some output artistic output is something that, that you should applaud you should you yeah, know and you also should... that they can do but also they might choose to do the same way that you do the ambient music and and yes. if somebody sees that they say well anybody can do that yeah okay well try it first <laughs> second <laughs> second second that's your choice it's different it's uh, it's it's uh yeah no i understand but critics uh you know i yeah critics are critics what do they do you know show me what you do show me your output criticize i know i know i know it's, i know, I know, yeah. I know. Yeah. we all know that but it's still it's still things and it's, yeah yeah it's it's just it's just that um when the when the emotion sort of like becomes sort of almost like a, a existential threat which is, uh, you know, the, and this is why I say it kind of like relates to, to my uh, experience with my own anxiety, right? So I have to fight anyway, every single day to get anything done, right? And then I'm being criticized for doing what I do, which is already <laughs> such a, which is already such an effort, right? Yes. And, and, and then I, then I'm- uh, You do it because you think it's the right thing to do. And, uh, and it, yes, no, it's, but hey, life is unfair. I mean, I'm yeah. going to sound brutal, but that's true. <laughs> no, that's, it's unfair. That's, <laughs> that's how it is. And, and unfortunately, not everybody, not everything can be monetized and, and, uh, and not everything is seen for its own value. And sometimes it's in own time, in its own times. Think of, I was, you know, I was thinking about your music and I thought some of it reminded me, oh, he's, a, he's doing cubism, right? Because yeah. you take music, you deconstruct and you redo. To do that, you need first to be somebody who can really understand and play the music well. It seems easy from the outside. It's like Picasso was criticized. Well, look at Picasso's. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. yeah, so anyway. It's, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and you know, I'm, it's, just, it's just that I'm also, quite frankly, um, like I said, in psychology, I'm interested in the research, right? And it's the same with music. And I have only just started to also, you know, engage in this sort of like social experiment, which is like publicized conversations. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, like, yeah, most of the feedback I'm get, getting is great. And I, you know, like I've had this idea for sort of like a talk show kind of format for decades, because I remember watching, watching TV, even like as a teenager, like the talk shows, like the, 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 the questions always stopped at the point where I was actually getting interested. In yeah, exactly. Thing. It's like, yes, exactly. Yeah. And so, so my idea was like, even I remember it was uh, in 2008, I spoke with my friend, Nick Berch, who I also had uh, as in this series of podcasts already. I spoke with him and I said, uh, Nick, let's do, let's do uh, a talk show kind of format where we invite people and we ask them really about how they do the things they do. Mm -hmm. So, which yeah. which is really the point where every everybody else stops asking, right? And and um, and so it's this the idea is old, right? So and it was just and and yeah, but it's it's more that the unstructured. There is no timing. Okay, we have to go to a break. Okay, two seconds. You know, you need to get your sound bite. Oh, it's just 
yeah, it's very interesting to me. It made me realize again, that's what I've missed the most is uh, sometimes deep conversations or what you would have with friends and they invite somebody you don't know and they come over for dinner and you have a glass of wine and you start talking and it's so rewarding and, and interesting and it goes in directions, not structured. And so, yeah, it, it's very interesting uh, how you can monetize that. It's, it's tricky, it's tricky. I mean, you know, uh, you know. The, the funny, the funny thing is that I'm not, I'm not really uh, that concerned about that because I believe that uh, this example of this this nice lady that wants to donate, right, or donated already, uh, I've, if if there are just like a few more people that want to do that, um, you know, we'll we'll see. But I think I think that eventually, like all, you know, uh, great work is not wasted. You know, that's no. what I think. So. <laughs> you, you cannot, and whatever. So it's funny because I do mentor a lot of students and younger professionals and all that. And they sometimes, oh, should I go to grad school? Should, you know what? I always say the same thing. And it's going to sound maybe crude again, pretty rough. But you know what? Whatever you do with conviction is going to be great. You're going to be a janitor. Who cares? I've mopped show, uh, stages for years. I was never mm -hmm. ashamed. I did it with purpose and you do it white and it's actually there's a technique to do that and you you take pride in your work yes and unless you stay in your parents basement and smoke pot and do nothing that's a waste that's that mm -hmm. some people do that it to me it's a waste whatever you do do it with conviction the path you choose the order the sequence of things doesn't matter you're going to learn something and develop your person and your skills and all that stuff and and whatever you do is forward you know you need to learn from everything so yeah so now your podcasts are gonna last three hours <laughs> so. yeah I, I know i know you gotta go right yeah i'm on vacation actually this week so i'm oh, taking okay. my free time with you <laughs> oh, thank you so. no it's good it's good yeah. i needed a vacation i'm i'm yeah lots of work it's good i love what i do but you need a break. You need to yeah. reset the brain and and thinking through and so. Yeah, I have I have the same aim for this month to not work too much and. That's my goal. I've I've failed miserably, uh, for <laughs> years. I fail at it almost every day. Even if I was off yesterday, I still work five hours. So, yeah. So it's it's. Uh, but you have your you have your vacation shirt on now. Uh, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's not a pyjama anymore. So. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, anyway. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Always a pleasure. Interesting. It was nice to learn more about your uh, the, the different paths you took also that uh, while the music is the, is the main thread throughout you, you explore different things it's it was interesting to learn that and i hope others uh, enjoy listening to this and learn about your process as well i'm sure of that yeah. you see like like and you know like for me it's when i'm when i'm talking about myself uh i can you know it's only like this small this sliver of the truth that i can deliver right because like mm -hmm. life is so complex and there are so many things happening at the same time right so so i guess like you, you know we could have the same you could ask the same questions again and, we, and it would be a different set of answers. Yeah, yeah 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 and it's, plus the way we tell stories is based on facts and events but there's way more to life than uh, the things that happen or that we make yeah, happen is the yeah. we just talk about the the mindset the emotions all the stuff the personal decisions and whatnot and so yeah it's yeah, interesting. Yeah. And you know, on, on the on the way from uh, back from Italy uh, yesterday, I was talking to uh, to my colleague in the car and I, I told him some some stories and some things that I haven't uh, haven't thought about for a long time, like pretty pretty traumatic stuff, for example, mm. which and it's it's kind of it's kind of like interesting how these these many uh, lifetimes you know i feel like a lifetime always includes many many different lifetimes and for everybody 
Like, this, yeah. so this is the whole mm -hmm. the point I'm trying to make. It's not like that your life is is richer than Special. mine or no. or whatever. No. Like, I think like everybody's life is incredibly rich, and like and and I would even go so far to say even that uh, that person in the basement uh, smoking. Yes, dope, that's true. They, they, there's yeah, also because 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 the 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 um, this time doesn't stand still. No, right? it never does, and. Never does. But I'm judgmental of people who don't do anything. So there I said it. I'm guilty. <laughs> taking yeah. a break, taking a pause is one thing. You need the reset and different people do it differently. But uh, but, but just just imagine, but just imagine the experience you're making there, you know, and I'm saying it's it's probably not a rich experience, it's the opposite. But then the 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 the, the, the human being to deal with that. Like mm -hmm. if you think yeah, about yeah, people yeah. in prison, for example, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you 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 know, I think it's I I, I think it's okay that you're judgmental, but it's it would be wrong to say that uh, like that kind of experience can't be. Hey, it's you know, your in a way. In a, yeah, exactly, exactly. But and I've yeah. known people who went through those phases, and somebody I respect tremendously is brilliant and amazing, and it. It's it's just I'm thinking more in the practical sense. This is not the way to just go get a job, do something. Hey, you, you don't feel good, uh, go and volunteer and help out. And uh, and you might think you don't have the resources to do that, maybe because you're depressed. But mm -hmm. if you start to give uh, and and give you you have capabilities, you, you, if you're healthy or there's always something you can do that's productive um if not for you for others mm -hmm. you know it's it's not just about ourselves and i think we learn yeah. the most when we share and give to others mm -hmm. and uh, it's really important i think you do that in your teaching i do that when i mentor uh, younger people in in my field and others it's it's uh, enabling people to realize their potential whatever it may be and it's mm -hmm. not just about producing making money it's, it's uh, a human being potential developing, right? It's yes. it's richer than uh, than a paycheck or just a product. It's, yeah. it's a whole life thing. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's do our best. Yes, let's do our best. Let's keep on doing our, our best. I'm gonna go do my best lounging by the pool with a margarita. I think this afternoon. <laughs> Good idea. Good idea. <laughs> okay, pleasure. Yeah, thank to thank you so much for this. Thank you. It was great. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye.